These birds are completing a mammoth journey that began in Arctic Russia and is ending here in Australia. The last leg of their journey is a non-stop flight from South Korea, a distance covered in just three to four days. For some, it may be one of their last journeys. Making a mockery of its international commitment to saving wetlands, the South Korean government is well on the way to eliminating their vital summer resting place and one of Asia's most important wetlands. The place is called Simangum. To the developers, it's one more step to modernity. To its opponents, a catastrophe in the making for the birds and the fishermen of this part of the Yellow Sea. When completed, Simengum will occupy an area equal to one-third the size of Hong Kong and its 33-kilometer embankment will be the longest sea dike in the world. With its strategic location in the heart of Northeast Asia, Simengum will be one of the busiest commercial and industrial hubs of the entire region in the 21st century. I've been to Simengum and I couldn't believe it. There in front of my eyes, this massive dike to enclose the mudflats that uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of birds from all around the world come to on their migration to elsewhere in Asia and from the South Pacific. They're going to flatten more than 100 mountains, fill it in, and then use it for profitable um, industrial and or agricultural pursuits, displacing the local people and their fisheries as they do it. Uh, in a word, big money, greed, the, the huge uh, construction and, and car manufacturing corporation with the Korean government against the interests of the local people. And as a result, one of the most remarkable feeding grounds is going to be abolished. This Simengum is close to annihilation. In a mere 40 years, South Korea has been transformed from an agrarian society to one of the four Asian tiger economies. This economic miracle has given Koreans a living standard on a par with Western nations. It's densely populated with over 48 million people. In a country where land for development is at a premium, reclamation has been a high priority, with environmental safeguards a very low priority. In common with many countries, Korea has looked upon its wetlands as wastelands, ideal for factories and ripe for conversion to rice paddy. For a country that's known famine in living memory, self-sufficiency in rice is the objective. Converted to rice fields, these bleak tidal mudflats along the Yellow Sea on Korea's west coast would aid the drive to self-sufficiency. Into the bargain came lucrative civil engineering contracts. Korea's most ambitious seawall construction began in 1991. So far, about one quarter of this coast has been barraged with little concern for repercussions on natural resources. Korea acceded to the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands in 1997. Under Ramsar, countries placed their significant sites on a list of wetlands deemed to be of international importance. Simengum was not listed, even though the Secretary-General of Ramsar told Earth Report it richly deserves that status. As long ago as 1999, the Ramsar chief wrote a letter of concern to the government. So far, there's no indication that the government has any intention of responding to the outside world's pleas to save the endangered tidal mudflat. Neil Moores moved here six years ago with a commitment to document numbers of shorebird species and the impact of development. The survey work of water bird populations in the late 1990s suggests there's about 63 sites in South Korea that meet Ramsar criteria for identification as being internationally important. About 45 or 48 of these are coastal wetlands, including, of course, Semangum, 
the Cum Estuary and a number of other sites mostly concentrated along the west and south coast. These tidal flats form a significant part of the whole Yellow Sea ecoregion, which are key for spawning fish, nursery areas, for crabs, for seaweeds. That whole system, its vitality, depends on free-flowing rivers, it depends on the health of salt marshes, but almost all of the rivers in Korea are barrage, leaving just a few small free-flowing rivers to help this system support the abundant life that has existed here for thousands and thousands of years. The importance of Korea's estuarine habitats to migratory birds is apparent when the scale of their movements is seen. Each year, hundreds of species, including highly threatened ones, such as the great knot and spotted greenshank, leave their summer breeding grounds in the Arctic North. They arrive in Korea famished and exhausted, and spend up to two weeks feeding on the mudflats, building up energy for their four and a half thousand kilometer journey south. After leaving Korea, they fan out to Australia, New Zealand, Thailand and Malaysia. An estimated two million shorebirds use the Yellow Sea wetlands as a staging post on their spectacular migration. Traditional salt harvesting ponds provide an inferior habitat for migratory birds when natural mudflats are lost. Birds collect here at high tide. If nothing is done and the developers complete the seawall at Simengum, the original ecosystem will vanish. Scientific research carries on, but it's likely that the findings will be a matter of historical record. There are 2,000 spoonbill sandpipers in the world. They are really rare. Our team saw 200 of these birds here last year. That's 10% of all the world's spoonbills. If they destroy this place by constructing the sea wall, it will cause their extinction. Nearly all the west coast of Korea has sea dikes and after this goes, they will have nowhere left. Our team began research from the early 90s and discovered that many species visit here, but at that time construction had already begun. We couldn't stop the construction no matter what we found here because it had already begun. When it's finished three years from now, the sea wall will be the longest in the world a feat of civil engineering that's been a long time in the making. Conceived in the 1970s, work on the dike didn't begin until 1991. Since then, progress has been plagued by cost and time overruns. There was nationwide publicity focusing on the disastrous environmental consequences of a reclamation project at Shihua, near the capital Seoul. In 1999, the opponents of Simengum seized their chance and managed to halt construction to allow for further research into the impacts on the tidal mudflat. That's why the research group was formed. In order, there were about 30 members of which 10 were experts provided by the environmental organizations, 10 from the government and 10 from the development office. So, from the beginning, the government had created a one-sided situation where its wishes would be most reflected above all others. However, as the experts began to express conflicting opinions, the government shied away from disclosing the research group's working process and at times made decisions in behind-closed-doors meetings. The agriculture organization, which is in charge of construction, speaks of an environmentally friendly way to reclaim this land. They have taken the phrase environmentally friendly away from its context. What we are saying is that there is no way that this project can be done in an environmentally friendly way. Reportedly, there is fierce division within the government on whether the Simengum project should be abandoned altogether. Earth Report was told that some Environment Ministry officials are embarrassed that the government should be flaunting its commitment to saving the remaining wetlands. Clearly, 
the developers within the other ministries won out, for the recommendation of an expert review panel to cancel the project was ignored, and in mid-2001, construction resumed. The Ministry of Agriculture justification is that each year, up to 30,000 hectares of farmland is lost to creeping urbanisation. Also, it claims the seawall will prevent flooding as well as providing freshwater reserves. The project managers have implemented design modifications and given more attention to water purification systems. After reassessing the project in conjunction with civil groups and coming to the conclusion that there were no problems with the economic and the technical viability as well as water quality. We recommend construction in May last year. During the time of research, the experts from the government and environmental groups offered many helpful suggestions, and we used them all to improve water quality, conservation and environmental problems. Environmental organizations are still concerned about the Semangon project and are not in 100% agreement with us. The reason is that they see parallel with Shiva and, as I have said, we carry out the perfect methods to maintain water quality, so there are no worries. Shiwa, just outside Seoul, has proved a disaster, and the reclaimed land remains unusable. The government admits that not enough care was taken in controlling industrial waste. The concentration of dioxins here is the highest known in Korea. The tourist viewing site has been locked since its opening. The land is poisoned. But not all the news is bad. In accordance with the Ramsar Convention, authorities designated Wupo freshwater lakes as a protected region. Although there are only two Ramsar sites in the whole country, it's a positive step. Residents of the Wupo lakes harvest its resources sustainably and are proud of its new status. Wetland ecology is taught to school children as guided discovery walks give first-hand experience to the pupils. They're learning that the true value of intact wetlands is to keep them that way. Generally, in Korea's other reclamation projects, although the type of birds may lessen, the number and kind of birds increase after completion of the construction. We expect this place to be the same. We are going to create a large environment for birds to inhabit within the reclaimed land. Artificial lake of 1,000 hectares as well as 2,000 hectares of undeveloped water reserves are planned in order to attract bird populations. Any small modifications to seawall design or creation of parks or some filtration system for water really misses the point. Semangum, what remains of the Mangyung and Tongjin River and Tidal Flats, is an estuarine system. The species that can only be supported by that kind of system. 
It's the most important site in the whole of the Yellow Sea for shorebirds and for many other migratory bird populations. It's an absolute critical natural resource. It's not only bird populations that are affected. Estuarine habitats are the spawning ground for many commercial fish species from the Yellow Sea. Virtually uncontrolled development of the coast, including massive dam projects on the Yellow and Yangtze rivers in China, have destroyed breeding areas and decimated fish stocks. Both South Korea and its giant neighbour are waking up to the threat. China now imposes seasonal fishing bans and has started a nationwide plan to reverse reclamation of wetlands under the auspices of the United Nations. China and South Korea have formed the Yellow Sea Large Marine Ecosystem Project with the aim of creating a cross-border integrated management system. But the accord may come too late to save the old sea mangum. The Seimangam project, although it was noble in its design originally, noble in its intent, now is known to be absolutely seriously flawed. There is no doubt that through its construction, there will be very significant impacts on not only biodiversity in Korea, but throughout the whole of the flyway. A huge scale model of Seimangam gives hydrologists opportunities to study economic construction techniques and analyze environmental changes. It's predicted that the speed of the tide just before gap closure will be over 20 kilometers per hour. Controlling the erosive force at this stage is vital. The research has led to environmental mitigation schemes. The design of the wall has changed to provide fishways and the gradient made less steep with the aim of helping shallow dwelling marine life to re-establish and possibly allowing new mudflats to develop outside the wall. Even if mitigation measures are effective, they won't save the traditional fishing communities. What of their future? We got compensation and we knew it was because of the project, but we didn't realize it would block the sea. When I got compensation, I just spent it all. Not everyone got money, only some. The most anybody got was $8,000. If we knew that the sea would be blocked, we would not have taken the money. I saw this when I was out catching. I only catch a third of what I used to. Now it's really hard to get even 10 pounds. It seems to me that in the future, we are to die by suffering. There's nothing we can do. We get our food only from the sea. I've got a large family, seven people to feed. Fewer than a third of local people have a farm. I've got nothing to do. I'm just too old. Young people can't go to the city to work. What are they doing by blocking the sea? They are bloody mad! Hyung Rok Shin left his city job to set up the civil rights organization, the Bawan People's Association. The association is marshalling the activities of various groups opposed to the seawall, and that includes the shellfish collectors who've been barely consulted. There is virtually no one who is not connected to the fisheries in Kyohua village because of the regional characteristics. 
For everyone, fishery and life go together. Farmers are in fishing too. After the Simangam project, changes were effected to the environment and the fish disappeared. It became impossible to maintain a living from fishing. As the Simangam construction has carried on for 10 years, fishermen have changed jobs and fishing villages have disappeared altogether. Talking about culture, the culture of this area originated from fishing activity. Festivals such as Pung Ah and Dang Sang are all influenced by fishing, but now they have all disappeared. Koreans are no strangers to protest. People taking to the streets in the 1980s helped to end military rule, a big step for a country that's officially still at war with the communist north. The first opposition candidate to be democratically elected to the presidency was Kim Dae-jung in 1997. But environmental protest is relatively new in South Korea. People like Reverend Moon are changing that. After spending years in prison for his part in the protests, the Catholic priest has turned his attention to the fight for Simengon. He's bringing together Christians, Buddhists and animists in a last-ditch effort to save Simengon and the people who get their livelihoods from it. I cannot forget this story. This story of a poor woman living by the mud flat is ingrained in my memory. I have never in my life had a bank account, but I have an account given to me by the heaven. If this account is taken away from me, I have no basis on which to live. The death of the mud flood is the death of me and the fishman. The death of the fishman is the death of the community. The death of the community is the death of this country. Although a total of $400 million compensation was paid to the fishing industry and individuals by the government, the community is dying. Without access to the sea, Fishing villages lie deserted and aquaculture farms abandoned. With the compensation money, some people built new houses, but since the schools have now closed, families with children have left. Only the elderly remain. The irony is that since the mid-90s, South Korea has experienced a rice glut, so the main reason for the project has vanished. But Ro Mu Hyun, the new president, has announced that since it was no longer needed for agriculture, the destroyed mudflats would be used for industrial development. Uh, this is really a place where, where worlds meet. Sky, sea, mud, old Korea and the new Korea, where people meet water, where they can take fish, they can take shells, they can take shrimps, they can make a livelihood from one of the most productive and beautiful ecosystems in the world. The uh, majority of Australians don't know about it, but the Korean government are about to remove maybe 10% of all the migratory birds in Australia because they'll, they'll fly to Korea and starve. The only counter to a massive proposal like this is international outrage. There's one thing like, that corporations understand and that is bad publicity. I think dead birds, killing of migratory routes, wiping out of ancient populations of birds, as well as the people who depend on those fisheries. Now, if everybody thinks that way, Korea will respond. But while they're safe and sound and the world doesn't know about this, they're okay. They're making lots of money and they're destroying the environment in Korea.
The protesters may lose the battle to save Semengum, but there's still a million hectares of tidal mudflat left on the Yellow Sea coast. Their hope is that when the next scheme is proposed, they'll be better prepared.